I'm here with Sean McGinnis from Build Able. Uh, it's a company here in Ottawa that was started by you and your wife, Kyla. Uh, we'll get to the details about the story of the company, but I was really interested in speaking with you in terms of your role here and how the company has evolved and how you are foreseeing its growth and what you do in your role as running the company and also running the operation. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what got you to now run this company and run the operations of it? Well, thank you very much for having me on, Pierrette. Uh, my name is, as you said, Sean McGinnis. Uh, I'm the president and managing partner of Build Able. Uh, what we are is we're an accessibility contractor. Uh, we specialize, though, in barrier-free renovations and accessible renovations. Um, so we do anything from installing grab bars and small things that are high impact, like tub cuts, um, right up to doing renovations for people's homes so they can stay in it for longer uh, and retrofitting businesses so they can open to um, uh, be more inclusive to the population in Ottawa. So Build Able is new because you just went through a rebrand, correct? That's correct. So what was the evolution of the company? How did it start? What were the grassroots, what's the grassroots story of it? And then how has it evolved to now being a bill? It's called Build Able. So we actually started out uh, on a crazy idea of uh, installing stair lifts, and we were branded as Next Step Transitions Incorporated. Uh, it was started with my spouse, Kyla Colleen, uh, and obviously myself. Uh, my background is actually as an elevator mechanic, um, and it really started sort of um, organically. I had uh, installed a, a stair lift for a friend of mine's grandparents um, as a favor. Uh, just because of my background and uh, I left there feeling really really good about <laughs> what I did and see him he uh, His big thing is he wanted to go down to his basement just to look at his tools He couldn't even really use them anymore, but he just wanted to be near his tools. It was wow. important to him So I left feeling really really good um, And we ended up doing another one for a uh, same thing a friend of a friend uh, Getting them down to their basement in their bungalow and it was just one of those things where I was sitting chatting with Kyla and we, we decided man this, there's something here um, my partner Kyla is a registered nurse um, who's done her master's and did a lot of work in aging in place while she was doing her master's um, and we decided that yeah there's really something here we're feeling good about this mm -hmm. so it started out with mostly doing lifts um, because of my background again in small things like grab bars uh, and from there it evolved into the renovations when we took on a partner named Dan Charette um, and he came with his company word of mouth construction and we consolidated consolidated our companies uh, to be what we are today so how big is your team right now? So we are a staff of 11. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, about half of that in the field. Uh, we have a full-time project manager who's a Red Seal carpenter. Her name is Maureen Craven, a uh, fantastic project manager. We have a sales estimator, um, as well as we have a community outreach uh, person as well that'll go out uh, in the community and, and do some events for us, who's actually a former Paralympian as well. And the, the people that are on your team, are they all staff or contractors? How does, how does the operational side work for your company? So the people on our team are all staff. We do work with, uh, we do engage with subcontractors for the professional trades, such as electricians, uh, plumbers, uh, heating and ventilation, and gas. Mm -hmm. Those are the trades are mandatory to have a license. Uh, those people specialize in those trades, and depending on the job, we'll bring in people that specialize in one area more than another. So... Our side of the company is mainly just the carpentry side and the finishing side, mm -hmm. uh, along with the project management. So with that, so you have those subcontractors f for those specialized uh, roles that you need for the projects. What are the basic projects that you do? You mentioned a few of them. So if a client comes to you, what are, what are they challenged with the most? Yeah, our, our, our number one goal uh, and probably the number one challenge that people face is uh, falls prevention. Well, often mm -hmm. what will happen, uh, you do get the rare case where somebody is really progressively minded uh, and wants to uh, adapt their home before they ever needed any of the adaptions. But for the most part, it's generally somebody has a loved one or, or somebody has a fall uh, in their home uh, or, or they're getting surgery and they need to be discharged from the hospital and they say these adaptations need to be made. So a typical thing would be front entrances to homes are often can be a challenge. You mm -hmm. often will get big, steep, icy stairs leading up to the house. Um, and then the other biggest challenge and probably one of the more dangerous rooms in the house would be the bathroom just because of the nature there's water. You're stepping over right. uneven surfaces. Um, so typically we'll get somebody to come in and it usually starts with the bathroom and front entrance and we go from there. So when I worked in home transition, so you know I had a home transition business. And when I did site visits for clients and we're doing, looking at retirement residences, one of the biggest things that would come up is the bathtub. 
Yes. Right? It, at that point, they're starting to have more challenges getting in and out of the tub. There's a risk of a fall. So what does Build Able do for those who still either want a bath or they have a bath, but now they might not be able to get in a bath? So two different scenarios there. Yeah. Well, on the first scenario, and, and we certainly don't want to come into your home and say, you can't have baths anymore. Right. We really want to make the house adapted to the way, within reason, um, that somebody wants to live. And our biggest goal is just to keep them safe and, and help them achieve their goals by keeping them safe mm -hmm. uh, and keep them safe at the same time. So somebody that wants to keep a bath, there's a few options. We can do anything from a quick uh, tub cutout, which is essentially we'll cut a 24 inch wide by nine inch deep um, portion out of the tub and we put a cap over it. Okay. Um, and then from there you can get an insert that comes in and out so it can dual as either a walk-in shower or a bathtub. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition with some grab bars and anti-slip treatment that can usually keep somebody uh, safe in their bathtub for, for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, best case scenario is actually we, if somebody says, okay, I'm done, I can't have baths anymore, um, is we, we can uh, do, take the bathtub out and actually do a barrier-free shower. Uh, and the way we do that is we actually take everything out right down to the subfloor. Uh, we'll put in a... Um, a waterproof uh, shower pan that's, that goes underneath the tile and we'll tile over top of everything. So we can get a sort of spa-like bathroom that's beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, completely safe, uh, and and adds value to somebody's home. Uh, and you never know that it's 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 there just because they need it for for their safety. Yeah, and I'm thinking of my mother-in-law specifically because <laughs> one of the things that was really on my mind every time I would go do a site visit at a retirement residence was my mother-in-law. Not that she's moving into a retirement residence, right. but she loves her bath. And a lot of retirement residences do no longer have tubs. No. Yeah, they're moving away from tubs. This exactly. The yeah. Right, because of the liability and there's that risk of somebody getting of hurt. So um, that's why the question always comes up for me is how would you help someone like my mother-in-law who absolutely loves her bath it's a nightly ritual it's part of her of her even self-care her well-being it's really that important to her so that's why that question comes up for me specifically personally for sure yeah and I'm sure you see it all the time so in terms of your operations what are some of the things you guys struggle with the most uh in the beginning and I think this is probably pretty normal is uh Understanding cash flow was always a hard one for us. We're in construction. There is mm -hmm. a lot of ins and outs in terms of material. There's a lot of labor going in and out. Um, so that was right off the start. That was one of the ones that we decided we need to get a hold of. Right. Uh, and that really helped actually being able to decide when to invest, when not to invest, when to hold and uh, slow down. And that's been, that was an, in the beginning, one of our bigger struggles. Uh, the other one uh, was staffing, which is, again, I think a lot of businesses go through. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly is a lot of people out there, but there's not necessarily the right people that meet the qualifications as well as meet your vision to help grow your company. Because when your staff goes out, uh, they are a direct representation of who you think you are and who, or who you are and, and what your company is. And it's yeah. amazing uh, how important that is for, for a company to have good staff and also just to keep the morale high. Everybody's yeah. happy when everybody gets along. So. Well, I'm curious about your culture. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a recent post of yours. I don't know if you posted or Kyla posted. It was a group photo. Yeah. And we do a lot of group activities with my 1-800-GOT-JUNK business. Yeah. I think the culture is so important in a business. Like you said, they are the face of your company and you need to nurture them. Absolutely. So what do you guys do to build that culture with your team? Uh, most importantly, we try to get everybody together as often as we can. Uh, we used to go uh, every week we would have something. Uh, in the morning just to get together where give everybody a chance to um, to bounce ideas off each other get to know each other um, and at the very least we will do at least one sort of social get together uh, once a month where everybody comes in we have a barbecue nobody has nice. to worry about uh, there's no formalities at all to it it's just more about uh, getting to know each other and, mm -hmm. and again just socializing uh, that's been a big piece the other piece of it is uh, keeping everybody and I feel this is really important uh, keeping everybody as informed as possible uh, in terms of the direction of where the company's going. So everybody has a similar sort of idea of the vision of where, where we're going. Uh, and then uh, also just sort of talk about the goals of when, when, we, when we meet each client, uh, how they can make a big impact with the client as well. And if there's anything that they see on site and they can suggest. So it's, again, it's, it's keeping them 
everybody educated enough to speed on what, what the company is doing. It sounds like you also have open communication. We have very open communication. It is uh, super important to me. It's something yeah. that I benefited from in a previous company that I worked for, and that's something that I uh, feel very strongly about in this company as well. So you talked about vision yep. and how it's important to share that with your team. I'm in absolute agreement with that. I think it's important that when you are growing a company that they all feel like they're part of it that they're a really integral part of the success of it. And when things go wrong, that there's responsibility that's shared, or if it's one particular person, that you can talk to them privately and resolve that. So you talked about vision. I want to get back to that. So what is the vision of Bill Dable? Without revealing a lot, you don't have to. This, you know, Your vision is, can remain private and within your team. But if you were to talk to somebody as another COO, someone who's running operations, what is your vision for the company and how do you foresee growing that operationally? Okay, well, our biggest vision is to make Ottawa inclusive uh, in terms of uh, opening up the barriers in uh, other people's homes and especially in businesses where um, those businesses can have the opportunity to have uh, a skilled work pool that they may not have been able to access before just because there was uh, a barrier at the front of the building and maybe that those people couldn't come in. Uh, or or a customer base that they didn't have before. So in terms of um, our big our big broad broad goal is to make it auto accessible, and that's really really what we want to do. And nice. that, I think that, that that topic can be pretty well unlimited uh, for for the areas that you can impact with that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there's a lot of people who need need just even small adaptations in the home, and obviously I would say the majority of businesses out there need uh, need some upgrades to be able to open their doors up to the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do that operationally? <laughs> <laughs> That's a big vision, right? That a That's big a vision. big audacious vision, but I love that. Yeah. That, that, that always means there's going to be opportunity for growth. Yeah. You're not limiting yourself. Absolutely. So if you're going to talk baby steps, what are some of the first steps and then some of the larger for steps sure. down no, the road? Thanks for slowing me down on this one. <laughs> uh, I always go big first. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the visionary. <laughs> really, you, right? really get back. Um, yeah. The biggest thing is getting involved in the conversation and getting involved with uh, groups that are actually trying to make change in the city. Uh, it's not always necessarily for profit. It is because we actually genuinely do want to help and actually mm -hmm. just do this. Um, so on the small scale, definitely getting involved with groups. Um, for instance, uh, if, if there's the opportunity, Rick Hansen Foundation does uh, grants for people. Um, as well as uh, March of Dimes, they often do they do uh, grants for for ho houses and homes mm -hmm. uh, for people in need that need those upgrades and can't necessarily afford them. Um, and then there's various other agencies that are really trying to make change in terms of opening up the doors in the city. Yeah, so it's it's awesome that you guys are there at the forefront That's, of it. Yeah, it's, and really tapping into that. Absolutely, it's really yeah. exciting actually to be part of that conversation. It's uh, probably the my favorite part of the day. I get inspired every single week I come to work. I, I'll meet somebody that just, I, I step back and I'm awestruck by what they're doing. Awesome. Awesome. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about some of the projects you worked on. Sure. Because I want to show people your work. Okay. <laughs> and let's, de let's deconstruct that a little bit. Sure. So let's unpack that. that my, unpack is my work. Maybe deconstruct would be in construction <laughs> yeah. a really good term to you. Well, we start with deconstruction, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to do demo day, right? Um, and I watch a lot of HDTV, so okay. <laughs> I like demo days too. Right on. So tell me about maybe one of the most recent projects you guys worked on. Maybe one that was a challenge when you first walked in and you really needed to strategically come together yeah. to make it happen. And then what was the end result? Okay. Uh, I'm thinking of a project we did actually, uh, it's on the border of Mechanicsville and uh, Hindenburg. Um, this project, we, the, the challenge was we had a very small room to work with um, that basically had no turning space at all mm -hmm. in it. And how can we open up the shower to be uh, uh, accessible and at the same time, still carry that sort of spa-like look and be beautiful and add to their beautiful home that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the challenge with that, uh, well, those were the biggest challenges. And then going from there, we had to pick the right fixtures um, that would work with that project. And part of it was they didn't want it, again, to look like a big hospital institutionalized uh, bathroom. Um, and then the other half of it was because of the nature of the room, because it was so small, uh, there was a lot of challenges in terms of water protection, things not getting damaged. We, we basically mm. assumed that everything was going to get wet in this room. So we made it a, like a proper uh, wet room is what okay. we did. Uh, so we, we gutted the whole thing, which had an, a 36-inch a acrylic shower pan and a standard vanity. Uh, and we reoriented, reoriented the fixtures to make it work with um, 
the new layout and we we replaced the barrier free or sorry the acrylic shower pan with uh with a zero threshold shower pan uh and then waterproofed all the walls all the floor uh and actually even tiled the base of the vanity so we had uh, no worries about water what is zero threshold zero threshold means there is literally <laughs> no uh step between the floor and the shower pan so essentially what happens is as you're walking along the shower pan starts to slope down from the floor okay. it's a very minor a uh, slope it's about a quarter inch uh, to every foot or something like that uh, so it's it's not noticeably steep but it is something that, uh, that allows the water to drain off uh, quickly and mm -hmm. efficiently but at the same time uh, provides easy access you can roll a wheelchair commode or just no tripping hazard as you're going into it perfect how much say does your client have in it I want to talk about that because you're the pros you're the experts so yep. you know what's out there and what's available to the client uh, and they probably have an idea of what they need, but not necessarily know. So what is the process from the client side, the experience for them? Uh, most importantly, it is actually the, the client has basically all the say. Okay. All we can do is suggest and, and, and use our experience to guide them. Um, but uh, the biggest part of the process is actually asking the client what they want out of it. What's their goals uh, for using their house? Um, and, and in the long-term goals for, for staying in their house, if that's, if that's what they're hoping to do. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we can basically just give them an idea of what's available to them. We've done a ton of research on, on that subject, obviously, so uh, guide them in the direction that uh, they feel is right and come up with a plan that, that works on all the levels. And that's a lot where uh, Kyla gets involved, where she's, again, the re registered nurse in the health uh, professional side. Uh, she can look at a, somebody with a progressive illness and say, um, this is this is probably what the long term mm -hmm. outcome of your illness is, is going to be. We're going to make sure that our our, our plan is going to work uh, for you, and at the same time, your short term goals are met. And, and usually, it comes down to either having a bath is either really really important to them, or or I really want to have that really cool spa like shower. It's right. going to look great, and and we just we guide them from there. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with two things. Sure. One, you're a new dad. I am a new dad. <laughs> so I want to talk about that because there's the business side to business, yeah. right? And we're speaking of business, yep. but there's also the real life side to yeah. speaking of business. Yeah. So talk to me about how being a new dad has impacted your role <laughs> in operations as the business owner as well. And just as you overall. Absolutely. It has been a challenge, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> uh, I'm sure somebody who else has been in business for a long time and has kids as well. Yeah. Uh, it has been a challenge. It was shockingly uh, uh, it was, or it was a big shock to us uh, actually when we when we did have our baby but uh, it has been probably one of the better things for the business so uh, my partner Kyla she had to step back a little bit from the operations of the business uh, which has been very difficult for her but also on the same side uh, we really did compartmentalize her role and we did find mm. uh, ways to do it more efficiently and find uh, people to fill in uh, for her position and it's made us it's given us in the end a little bit more freedom to sort of step back as we started to realize that we can't do the entire operation of the business. Uh, not only is that not um, efficient from a growth standpoint, but mm -hmm. also just having that family life that you want to have, uh, you, it is time to, to really start to think about if you're going to scale, then you, you need to actually make sure you have people that can cover off uh, if you step out of the office for a few hours. Mm -hmm. And her role is still the same, but just not as... Is it as involved or just not as active? She's definitely still uh, as involved in the uh, health professional side of it and the health mm -hmm. uh, end of it where she's reviewing our files. Um, and uh, But just less daily in terms of the operational uh, decision making as well as... Uh, a few less community events than she used to do. Yes, so yes. Slowed down for the time being. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Well, she had a new baby at home, right? <laughs> yeah. She she needs you. Exactly. Does she ever come to the office? She comes to the office pretty regularly. I, um, I'm, I'm sad that she's not here. I'm sorry. I'm looking I, forward to meeting her. <laughs> that could have gone one or two way, one of two ways. It would have been really great if she might have cried. But uh, she she's here at least once a week generally oh, nice. with uh, our dog Mulligan. It really is yeah. a family business. So yeah. uh, we uh, have a space for, for her when she's she, she needs to have a nap. She can do that. Nice. And uh, it's always a pleasure having her around the office. Well, when, when, I, when I started my first business, my son was still a toddler. And I was pregnant for my daughter while I have up. My first business was called Pampered Chef, right. a home-based home business. Yeah. And then when we started 1-800-GOT-JUNK, the kids were six and three. So they've only known us as entrepreneurs. Oh, my goodness. And my background's education. I was a teacher first. Yeah. So... 
it's amazing how how our businesses will really help our family life if we make it a priority that way and i i see you guys involving (laughs) i don't want to say her name because we want to keep it private but i I, you involve her in the business which is important and it also builds your team around that too right they get to support you in your role as parents as much as they support you in your role as running a business so Right. All right. So in closing, what do you want COOs and those running operations to know when it's really tough in business? Because I know you've been through those moments too, so that they can get on the other side of it. Because someone who's listening is probably going through a really tough time and they just need to have that word, those words of wisdom from someone who's been through it. Yeah, for sure. And the, the biggest thing is to dig in and make a plan. Uh, not to not to step back and become too overwhelmed. It's a, it's an easy uh, easy avenue to go down, and that's something that I'm sure every single entrepreneur has been through, or mm-hmm. every single person operationally running a business has been through. Uh, but you really need to dig in, uh, s- step back, and actually look at where the problems are and start working on them right away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. It was great to have you on our our Speaking of Business show. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for having me on, Pierre. It's been awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right.